external obsession that we have with acnea, important <laughs> though it is, and put on the table something we haven't quite yet seen, but we have to a degree, the possibility that autonomy might have a substantive law dimension. Hope you all appreciate what I mean by this distinction. It's one thing to say the EU is jurisdictionally autonomous, and it's another thing to say it is substantively autonomous. And of course, that observation brings us back to where I began, to the matter of EU public policy, on which I spent some time earlier. And I'm, po I'm pondering the relationship between EU public policy and autonomy. Substantive EU public policy and autonomy. Is there a possibility that the autonomy of EU law has this substantive as well as jurisdictional dimension? Now, if Achmea did not raise that, with all, everything else Achmea raised, it didn't raise that. But the Mikula case did. But the Mikula case did. And Mikula was, of course, an e intra-EU case that did raise jurisdictional questions that were addressed by the tribunals. But it also represented a substantive challenge to EU law. Obviously, state aid law. And You'll recall, of course, that the Commission, which is well represented in this room, I dare say, the Commission in Mikula uh, was of the view that, um, if you will, when a tribunal condemned Romania for withdrawing a state aid, when it condemned Romania for withdrawing the state aid, and condemned Romania to pay damages, the tribunal was, well, interfering with, undermining, I haven't got quite the right verb yet, um, EU public policy, without necessarily using that term. And therefore, when the tribunal issued that award, the commission, as we all know, forbade Romania to pay it on the ground that were it to pay it, that would constitute in itself an illegal state aid in violation of EU public policy. Now, here is the question. If in the eyes of the EU institutions, EU public policy operates as a substantive defense to what would otherwise be an intra-EU bit violation for which Romania would ordinarily be liable, might it also operate as a defense to what would otherwise be a treaty violation of the EU, by the EU itself, under CETA, or any of the other FTAs. Might an EU member state court be compelled, under the reasoning of Echo Swiss, mind you, to deny such an award, recognition, or enforcement on EU public policy grounds? Uh, just what does EU public policy demand in this context? And I'd like to call your attention to paragraphs 52 and 53 of the Acmea decision, in which the court rejected as insufficient the limited review that a German court would exercise, that German arbitration law allowed a national court to exercise when reviewing the validity of an award under EU law. The question then, if in Acmea, the level of scrutiny that would be exercised by a German court was insufficient, was too limited, one could only wonder, therefore, what would be the level of scrutiny that a member state court of the EU would be required to exercise vis-a-vis -vis an award that condemned the European Union itself for something um, it may have done. Now, I said a moment ago, and I'll say it again in passing, once we know whether these tribunals are tribunals or courts, we might have a better idea of what will be the willingness of the state, member states, uh, to um, deny enforcement to an award. 
I may be wrong, but I may think a little bit more deference would be shown to an international court, once we determine it is an international court, than a mere international arbitral tribunal. But we will see. Now, I near the end, and I get back to the term recalibration, which is in the title. I have, as is all too often the case, of course, raised more questions than I have answered. But these reflections prompt me to think about what the title um, of this talk conveys, Recalibrating the EU International Arbitration Interface, and more particularly, to what extent, how, where, might the EU do something that would mitigate the tensions? It is no secret that the international arbitration world and the international investment arbitration world in particular is caught up these days in serious soul searching. I don't think that's an overstatement when I think of the resources that are being devoted to the re-examination of the investor state regime as we know it today. Unsatral was mentioned. I'm a member of an academic forum led by Gabriel Kaufmann Kohler that is seriously examining any and every possible reform to the current system. Now, of course, it's entirely too early to tell what shape down the road investor state dispute resolution will take after this period of introspection has come to an end. But I think it's fair to say that whatever the reform that ultimately emerges, and it's difficult to imagine that there will not be reform of some kind, that will have demonstrated a willingness, if only under duress, but a willingness on the part of that legal order, international arbitration, to re-examine some of its most basic understandings. Whether or not the EU ends up with a multilateral investment court that it is currently championing, whether or not it does, I think it would have to admit that the re-examination by the international investor state community, the re-examination of things, will help the international arbitration EU law interface to take a turn for the better. It may not take a turn sufficiently for the better to satisfy the EU, but it will take a turn for the better. So, the converse proposition. How much room, if any, we well may ask, how much room is there for the European Union, conversely, to relax the demands that it has made on international arbitration. Opportunities are there. Opportunities are there. How promising they are remains to be seen. But I think it behooves us to think not only about the investor state regime re-examining its premises, but at least the exercise of doing that on the EU law side of the equation would not be a very bad idea. So I'll give you a couple of examples before I close that echo, I think, the points I've tried to make in this presentation. First, do the contours of European public policy as a ground for challenging arbitral determinations and think of the EU as a respondent, whether in competition law, consumer protection law, or any other public policy field, do they stand to be more clearly delineated and cabined than they have been? The European Union has not, to the same extent as most legal systems, yet cabined the notion of EU public policy. Might somehow the notion of EU law autonomy, <coughs> in whatever manifestations it may take, be reined in or at least better defined? and operationalize. Might the EU recognize that it is one thing, as I said, to assert autonomy of EU law vis-a-vis -vis the member states, a la primacy, and quite another thing, 
to assert the autonomy of EU law vis-a-vis -vis obligations emanating from international law regimes to which the EU has subjected itself. And, we might add, might the EU clarify whether its compliance with the rulings of tribunals established under its own investment treaties, however those rulings might be denominated, judgments, awards, are or are they not subject to defeasance in member state courts by reference to EU public policy? Is it possible, is it possible, as one commentator has recently pointed out, that the EU might employ its very favored principle of proportionality in determining what its relationship with international arbitration could be? I do not know what the recalibration exercise on the international arbitration side of the EU international arbitration interface will eventually yield. But just as some recalibration on that side is taking place, so too perhaps is some recalibration on the EU side of the equation. I tried to give some indications of where I think the points of relaxation might be, although I know there will be, would be enormous opposition to them. But I would say that given that the EU now seeks to be, and is already, a protagonist in the investor state arena, given its central role in shaping today's international legal order, its own efforts at recalibration, the efforts it might make in this direction, stand to do a world of good. I expect I have offended some persons in the room. I want to assure you that my motivations are positive. I genuinely despair when I hear, as I do, again and again, that there is going to be never any dialogue between the EU and international arbitration legal orders. It is that, and only that, that prompts the inquiry I've embarked on and the observations I've made.